You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 90. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, violinist, teacher, and high performance coach, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing great today. This week, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Frank Diaz to the show to cover a topic that is at the core of everything Mind Over Finger is, mindfulness. Frank is Associate Professor at the Jacobs School of Music and Affiliate Faculty for the Department of Cognitive Science at Indiana University. He's also the founder and director of the Institute for Mindfulness-Based Wellness and Pedagogy, where he collaborates with an international group of musicians, educators, and scholars on disseminating research and best practices on the art of mindful living, teaching, and performing. Frank has taught mindfulness to thousands of students across the U.S. and internationally and has served as a guest scholar, teacher, and advisor for numerous academic, civic, and arts institutions across the U.S. and abroad. His research on mindfulness has been published in peer-reviewed and practitioner journals and has been featured on NPR, CNN, Science Daily, and The Huffington Post. In our conversation, Frank elaborates on how he defines mindfulness, some mindfulness techniques that can be helpful for musicians, the sequence he likes to use when he teaches mindfulness, performance-related trauma, how we owe it to ourselves to tap into our inner resources, and much more. It's an information and inspiration-packed episode, and I hope you enjoy and find value in our discussion. Let's go to the show. Frank Diaz, it's an incredible honor to have you here today. Thank you. (laughs) Frank, I'm so happy that we're going to get to discuss one of my favorite topic, mindfulness, which stands at the core of everything I do with Mind Over Finger. And before we dive into our conversation, please tell us about you, how your artistic path has unfolded and how you got to where you are. Yeah. I, I always tell people that when I talk about this, I think I just look back in my past and I recreate a nice tight little narrative about what happened. Uh, and I think that's sort of human nature, but I'll do my best to uh, do a quick, re- you know, sort of synopsis of what happened. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Miami. Um, uh, there are musicians in my family, but they, they were mostly in Cuba. Um, so I didn't really uh, get to interact with them. I came to the States when I was six years old. But there was always music in my house and everybody sang and and uh, there were people in my family who played who weren't uh, classically trained. So they played drums, they played guitar, you know, sort of a lot of amateur musicians. So I, I, music's always been a part of my life. And as a kid, I was just a multi-instrumentalist. I played guitar, I played bass, I played trombone. Uh, you know, I, I played whatever I could play and mm-hmm. uh, at some point had to decide what to do. So. I went to college. Um, I was going to uh, study either jazz bass or classical trombone um, and decided to go the classical trombone route uh, when I, I went to Florida State University and was a music education major uh, and at the same time could play my bass. Uh, so trying to keep both things going at the same time, but studying one. And so, you know, that's what my training was like. I did an undergraduate in music education, but I did a lot of performing, you uh, Went to Brevard Music Center, kept taking auditions, uh, you know, always kept my, my head in that world. And uh, once I graduated, I moved up to Philadelphia area uh, and uh, freelanced and taught school for a while uh, at the same time and then came back to Florida to get my advanced degrees and keep teaching. So basically, the trajectory has been for many years just to sort of keep teaching and playing uh, various instruments. And uh, finally, uh, after about 10 years of doing that out uh, as a public school teacher, I went back to get my doctorate. Uh, I was very, very interested in um, applying what I had learned as, as, a, as a meditator. I had I'd learned how to meditate when I was 13, 12 years old and got really serious about it at around age 18. And I was just fascinated by the intersection of meditation 
and music and teaching and conducting. And I thought what would be really cool is to go back to school to get a PhD, get a doctorate and learn about the scientific foundations of this because I was, I knew it worked for me and I had been in those communities, meditation communities and uh, for a long time. And I knew that I, especially the, 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 the approach, you know, what we call mindfulness uh, worked really well for students, like teaching students to do that, incorporating it into my teaching seemed to really um, affect them. And I kind of wanted to know more about the science. So I went back and during the PhD became very interested in cognitive science and neuroscience and tried to figure out, you know, if there's something to it. And uh, that has been basically my career since then. I graduated from Florida State University in 2010 with a PhD in music education and orchestral conducting. Uh, but uh, was doing a lot of research in this area. And after my, you know, did my dissertation on mindfulness and then started applying it at the University of Oregon. And it's now been, boy, it's been 10 years since uh, I took that idea, really 13, from, um, boy, that's really crazy. No one's going to take this seriously. Uh, this was a fad that'll go away to now what I do at Indiana, which is essentially about, uh, I would say, a, a good portion of my job is doing research on mindfulness, teaching mindfulness to the musicians, teaching it in the community, going around the country, talking about it. Um, so that's sort of been my career track. I mean, I still, I'm still a musician. I conduct, I, I teach, I, I play on occasion. Uh, I don't know that I would uh, put my playing up there as a exemplar of outstanding <laughs> technique anymore, but I still enjoy playing. And, uh, but, but most of my work really now is on meditation, uh, specifically mindfulness approaches for musicians and, and to some degree also, uh, teaching it to, to other people as well. So that's, that's sort of where, that's the big picture for uh, where I am right now. Hmm. I love hearing that. And it sounds like you and I should sit down in person one day and just talk for hours and hours <laughs> because everything that you say resonates with me so strongly. Oh, great. great. Before we sat here today, I asked you in an email if there were any specific topics or questions you would like me to ask you. Yeah. And the list you sent me was so perfect and it oh. covered all of the angles I think could be so beneficial for my listeners. So if that's okay with you, I just would like to go down that list that you sent me and thanks for making my preparation. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm excited to talk about these things. So. The first thing you mentioned was how we define what mindfulness is. So um, what is it for you? There, As you said, there's so many uh, contradictory approaches and definitions. So please yeah. tell us how you define mindfulness. Yeah. So I, what I call this the family resemblance approach, and it's not my idea. It comes from, uh, some really interesting work that's being done in neuroscience, uh, and psychology by, uh, folks like, uh, um, Cliff Saran and Amishi Jha and John Dunn, and I'm missing somebody, uh, uh Antoine Lutz, uh, and basically what what one of the things that started to happen in the scientific community is, you know, uh, the idea of um, or the problem of how we define mindfulness has come up. Because if you're going to study something scientifically, you've got to define what it is. You can't just have, uh, you know, various definitions and then, you know, uh, do research on it. And then you and I both, let's say we both do research on something and we get a, a, a particular outcome. And I go back and I say, well, what did you do? Why well, did this? Why well, did this? Well, that's not the same thing. And if we're not doing the same thing and we're talking about outcomes related to mindfulness, that's problematic. Um, so, so, but at the same time, mindfulness, that word is a word that was adopted by uh, John Kabat-Zinn uh, primarily uh, in the mindfulness-based stress research uh, program and the Massachusetts Stress Clinic. And he used that sort of as an umbrella term to talk about contemplative practices, right? So you have to sort of go back to that time and go, why did they call it mindfulness instead of contemplative practices or meditation or whatever? Uh, it's because the word meditation at that point was really uh, a, a, you know, a no-no, right? You really couldn't talk about that scientifically. So all that to say that what, what my approach is, is a family resemblance approach is to look at what is it that all of these things that we call mindfulness have in common? What, is there a common ground? Is there sort of a bridge between the meditative experience, uh, the, the science, the psychology, even to some degree, which we have to acknowledge, you know, the fact that mindfulness was um, cultivated as a particular type of practice within Buddhist communities, uh, you know, uh, 
thousands of years ago, right? That's another issue that I'll talk about later. So, so what does it mean to practice mindfulness? What does that mean? And so to me, it really does, I think you can boil it down to, to what, you know, roughly speaking, four processes, psychological processes that we can talk about that most people have access to, uh, all in it, within the space uh, of a particular ethical and intentional space. So let me flesh that out a little bit because I think it sounds confusing, but but it's actually, I think, quite simple. Um, all human beings, for, as far as we know, um, uh, or, or at least what we would call neurotypical human beings, because there's some folks, you know, so much diversity in the way that we think and process, you know, we we can pay attention or attention gets us, right? All of us have the ability to, in some way, manipulate our attention. It's simple. If I asked you right now just to focus on the sound, the timbre of my voice, most people could just focus on that or on my words, right? You, we have the ability to shift attention. So attention, right? The ability to focus on something willfully is part of every mindfulness practice that we know of. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it comes from Buddhism or secular mindfulness. We are given an object of attention. We're given something to focus on. A lot of times it's the breath. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes it's a sound. Sometimes it's a chant. It, you know, it just depends on what you consider mindful. So attention. The other one is uh, a process uh, called I, the scientific literature calls it meta awareness. Um, but but I think this is actually what a lot of people mean by mindful awareness, which is the process of just taking everything in, monitoring your environment for what's coming in. And one of the reasons I don't really like the word mindfulness so much <laughs> is because for us, mindfulness means thoughts. Mind equals thoughts for, for, for our culture and our particular processing. But really, when we're talking about meta-awareness and mindfulness, we're talking about the process of being aware of a lot of things. Like, for example, our somatic feelings, like what's coming up in our bodies, which is really, uh, for a lot of musicians, uh, you know, a, a deep, rich um, field of experience that is hard to articulate. This is the master musician thing where they tell you, I know how it feels in my body to do what I'm doing, but I can't articulate it for you, which to me tells us that some things are very difficult to conceptualize and think about. So meta-awareness to me is this process of just being aware of your feelings, your thoughts, your, your environment, your culture, your narrative, all the things that are going on at the same that are around you that make up your experience, right? Your, uh, to use a fancy term, your phenomenology, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have attention, I love that. right? Focusing on, so you should really, those two go hand in hand. Mindfulness practices will tell you to access your phenomenology or your experience, and then ask you to pick something to anchor on, right? Or vice versa, to let go of everything, right? So you're always, no matter how you do it, you're always dealing with your own experience and mindfulness, attention and awareness and the, and the relationship between those two things. The, the, the other two that I think are really critical is, um, and this, act, this isn't for everyone, but this one you will find in a lot of practices, which is this decentering. And decentering is, of course, just noticing your experience without getting caught up in it. Um, so noticing that I have a thought, not that I am a thought. <laughs> noticing that I, I'm having an experience, but I, I'm not that experience necessarily. This is one aspect. I don't reduce my entire existence to this one thing, right? Uh, and there's a lot of terms for that. Um, you know, I think some people call it dereification. Mm -hmm. uh, when you know a thought is just a thought, you know, and it might be, it's real, but it might not be true, right? And so dereification is the process of just l seeing things like thoughts specifically as events, but not necessarily true events or things that you have to get caught up with. So it's the process of letting go. And sometimes in meditation, you'll hear something like, just let, you know, let the thoughts arise and go. We're not fighting them, we're, but we're not becoming attached. And then I think this is incredibly critical and it's often missed. It's the intentional set. What we're finding out more and more about uh, in the research on mindfulness and, and some philosophers have brought this up and practitioners as well, is that if you don't have an intentional set, if you don't know why you're doing these practices, then we're not entirely sure they're actually effective. So, for example, one of the things that we hear a lot about is if you practice mindfulness, you'll be able to pay attention better. Maybe. Um, but, but if you don't know that that's why you're doing it, you're not necessarily going to notice any changes in your attention. Um, uh, or, you know, I'm practicing mindfulness because I want to be more aware of my feelings, but if they don't tell you, if that's not what you're looking for and you, you put, you know, an app on and all of a sudden you're doing like a mindful awareness practice, they're not telling you why you're doing this. And, and they're not, sometimes they don't give you the opportunity to set an intention. And so without that, 
I'm not sure, you know, how do you know your practice is doing anything? And so there's a big divide in the scientific and spiritual world and sort of practice world about is mindfulness just this natural process that if you do it, you're going to discover all these things. Maybe, maybe, but, but, but we're human beings and we need to make sense of our experience. And often the way we make sense of our experience is that we compare it to something. <laughs> we compare it to an intention. And to, so, so, um, in mindfulness, one thing that we activate is a sort of what we call a curious or non-aversive disposition, which is we look at our experience with curiosity and or neutrality. Or when we're doing like compassion practices, we activate a positive affect uh, towards ourselves or others, right? So there is what I would call the affective or emotional space state of mindfulness, which is neutral, positive. You know, you're always either noticing with curiosity or you're becoming positive. So a quick review, attention, awareness, uh, decentering or letting go, and then uh, uh, non-aversive um, or positive affect within intention. And those things are part of almost every mindfulness practice. I hope that's mm -hmm. not too technical for people. I mean, I think if it's very simple, if you just look like at a breath awareness exercise, right? Most people know, have done breath awareness. So what's, what's the object of attention and breath awareness? The breath, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. so you, that's where you hone most of your attention. Then they tell you, you notice when thoughts come up. So that's meta awareness, right? Notice if any thoughts or feelings come up. So you're holding your mind sort of steady. You're watching thoughts and feelings come up, right? So that means you're holding meta awareness. So that stuff can get in, right? You're not ignoring it. You're saying, yeah, this, emotions are going to come up. Thoughts are going to come up. So that comes up. And then they say, well, you either, it, there's no mindfulness task that says, now go chase those emotions and those thoughts and get highly involved in them. That's rumination and daydreaming, right? Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what mindfulness is necessarily. So what they usually would say is just notice when they come up and come back to the breath, right? Which right. is reorienting, or they'll say, let them go or just, just label them just thoughts, right? And then they're telling you all of this and saying, keep a neutral and positive affect as you as you do this process, they even tell you from the beginning, don't worry, don't get, you know, if you feel yourself getting upset, just let that go and just return to the breath and to be neutral, right? So, so all these things put together are sort of the mindscape of mindfulness um, that I think every practice has. So mm -hmm. gosh, that, that took a long time, but I, <laughs> I, hope that, <laughs> I hope that makes some sense. It makes so much sense. And, you know, I love everything that you said in terms of how it connects to neuroscience, because sometimes I feel like it's so easy for some people to dismiss mindfulness as something that's too woo-woo. But I find that when I can really connect that with some studies and data, and I can show how it's actually proven that it can be so beneficial, it's easier for me to bring in some, some people who might have been hesitant to try it. And I really resonate with so much of what you said, because I remember when I was at the beginning stages of creating what I now call the deep practice model, which is what I did in my research. I had this desire to help my students practice more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And at the root, I realized that some of them didn't have, not only did they not have techniques and they didn't know how to practice. And I realized when I would ask them how the What does it sound like? How do you hear? What does it feel like? They didn't know how to experience yeah. things. So where do you begin? You know, so I really set as a goal to figure out a way that I could at least in a short time that you work with the students at sure. the college level is four years. How do you teach that in four years? Or, you know, some private students you have at a younger age, how do you get to introduce them slowly to that and drawing from my experience, I started to think, well, you need to teach both the practicing techniques. Yes, those are important. How mm -hmm. to practice all of that, but also how can you start to bring their attention into their practicing? And I realized that if I could distill it to some mindsets, I decided to go with teaching some elements of bare awareness, yeah. beginner's mind, Yeah, that's and, which is an attitude, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what I find to be more and more the most important self-compassion. Yeah, and and that's uh, uh yeah, we can talk more about that, right? Which which is uh, especially for our field, that is so important, right? And and one of the things that I think comes up in mindfulness is a student 
when we give a mindfulness task to a student, whether we incorporate it into what they do as musicians, right, or we just give it to them on a side, as a side, we have to know what it is they need. There isn't mm -hmm. one mindfulness practice. There are various forms of mindfulness. And if a student is doing an attention practice, but what they really need is a self-compassion practice, then um, then that's nice. It's like saying, well, I'm practicing my, my uh, you know, I'm working on shifting today, but but it but it's really like my string crossings that are terrible. You know, <laughs> yeah, sure, I can work on shifting, but but if my string crossings are terrible, uh, you know, maybe that's what I should be working on. If if I'm not having, if I have a narrative of negative affect towards myself, f doing a breath awareness practice is not necessarily going to help that. Now, yes. no, it doesn't mean. I think the breath awareness practice can support parts of the self compassion practice, and you need it in some ways because otherwise you can't stabilize your mind, right? Uh, but but this is exactly what you just mentioned. Those things are right part of what we were talking about. Um, beginner's mind, right? Which is a, a, a thing we adopted from the Zen world, uh, mm -hmm. it, from Suzuki Roshi's old beginner's mind, uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind book, right? You know, that's another way of saying holding a non-aversive or positive affective state where you're curious, right? Yes. <laughs> so, right so, uh, bare awareness is meta awareness, right? It's just being aware of what's going on. And what you mentioned, which is, I think, so critical is that these, all these things are trainable. Not yes. only are they trainable, they have to be trained. Not everybody knows how to do this, right? And not only do they have to be trained, but but also when, when you talk about the scientific side, one of the things I like about the model that I'm speaking about um, is that it does tie to things we know about psychology and neuroscience. We know that there are psychological processes and uh, 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 neurological sort of dynamics that that relate to attention. Right. We know that to awareness, to all these things, there's a bridge there to the science. So if the mindfulness practices are actually affecting people the way they claim it's affecting them, we should see one of two things. Either it's not consistent with changes in, 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 in brain chemistry or dynamics, in which case we are measuring the wrong thing or mm -hmm. we sh you should see changes. If somebody says I can pay attention better then their baseline, the way that their mind or their brain processes attention uh, pre and post mindfulness should look different in some way, right? And, and you're right. Some people, I, I always say as a practitioner, I, you don't need the neuroscience to, 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 for it to be effective. You, uh, I don't, you know, uh, people who were practicing this stuff for 3,000 years didn't need to understand the neuroscience. <laughs> But in our world, in our sort of Western scientific framed world, it does give some validity um, to, to some of these practices. And we can see that it does affect us on some on some level, uh, you know, uh, the brain on some level. But I also have really weird ideas about the brain and, and our overemphasis on this giant piece of meat in our head uh, uh, w without regard to the fact that we're this embodied creature, that our brain is really a distributed our minds are really distributed systems from our brain and our bodies and our environment. Um, and so, you know, just reducing everything to the brain is like saying, I, I'm going to figure out exactly why riding a Lamborghini is awesome by looking at the way the pistons fire. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't tell you anything about the experience of driving a Lamborghini, right? Or I'm going to, you know, by, by understanding how much um, these neurotransmitters are you know, are, uh, are uh, happen in the brain, I'm going to understand why musicians love playing this particular type of music. Well, no, I mean, yeah, you can learn something about the neurotransmitter uh, or, or the changes in the brain, but that doesn't tell you about the experience of being there. So our science needs to expand a little bit to include the actual experiences that people are having, the context in which they're having them, and, and the sort of ways that we can bridge those things together. So I, I love, I mean, I think what you said makes a lot of sense in that way. And how do you go about teaching mindfulness to musicians? Yeah. So as you can imagine, um, you know, having spent some years researching this and being a practitioner myself, there, there are a few things. Um, first of all, I think uh, teaching mindfulness to musicians happens on three levels. Um, when I teach here a class here at IU called, uh, it's just called mindful uh, Mindfulness and Music. And it's a 16 week class and it's a lot of performance majors take it. And each week you learn a new practice, a new set of skills, you, you practice it, you log about it, and then you come in and do the next thing next week. And then we have master classes. Like sometimes students will perform and I'll, I'll show them, uh, I'll say, Hey, play something that really bothers you. You know, that, that, that makes you stressed out. Let me teach you how to use mindfulness to, 
maybe work through that a little bit. So it's a really awesome class. It's been going on for about three years here at IU. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there are a couple things. Uh, number one is I have a specific sequence, which I can tell you about, which I think is really important. Um, it's like anything else. You have to learn how to hold the instrument before you can play it. You can't just go to playing it. So I think there's some things that we should sequence. Uh, and then what I what I like to think about is, first of all, there's formal meditation practice. So I teach musicians to, here's some things you can do that are just basic practices that don't have anything to do with music. They're just universal. They're, they're ways of it. And then there's musical practices. So there's using these mindfulness processes that you talked about in the context of playing and performing or practicing. And then finally, what I call it, just informal or everyday practices, which is just now that you do that, how do you bring this into your life? So it's really an integration of the formal practice, the musical practice, and your life practice, what you do every day, your diet, your health, your relationships, and all those things. And so when we when we look at it that way, it's a much more ecological process than just saying, try this meditation practice and let's see if you play better. So those are the those are the three. So we teach exercises um, every week. You have to do uh, a formal musical or, inf- you know, you have some one of those three or two of those three or and then there's a process. And the process for me is very clear. Um, first, you teach students to stabilize their physiology. So their practice is with breathing, uh, what we would call pranayama in the yoga world that stabilize the, the, the way the body responds to stress. After that, I go to uh, centering the mind practices, which are like breath awareness and sound awareness, just settling the mind. When the body is calm and the mind is calm or or steady, then we could do more meta-awareness. We focus more on just being aware of all the different things, the way our body reacts to things, our emotions, what we do in specific settings, what triggers us. And then really after that, we we move into a much more, I think this is sort of the third process, a much more uh, difficult which is, section, which is uh, letting go of narrative. So once we've established all this, we can really clearly see how our internal narrative causes us pain or causes us to uh, sabotage our own playing and our own lives and our own relationships. And even what our goals and values are, sometimes students in my class go, I have this voice in my head that is basically a combination of my studio teacher, my mother, and, <laughs> and you know, some, you know, some friend I have who's telling me I have to do this. And I have never realized that that's just a voice in my head that I don't have to listen to. I can mm-hmm. create my own. So the last step on this is sort of intentional framing which includes practices like self-compassion, uh, uh, you know, re- things that help us shape our relationship to the world and to our experiences in a way that are going to be more positive and affirming um, and aligned with our values. So that's the process that we take, roughly speaking, that everybody ends up, you know, some people skip around a little bit. But when you do that, I think you cover mindfulness sort of as a as a curriculum from, and, and, and by the way, that last one, like doing, like you mentioned before, doing self-compassion practice is really difficult if you aren't aware of your body, for example. Yes. Because that's where you feel sometimes. I mean, it's in your body. When you feel emotion, it's an embodied process. It's not a thought necessarily. Yes. Yes. So how do you do self-compassion You know, if you've never been able to hold your mind steady or notice your body? So it's not that you can't, but if we don't start there, uh, you know, it's like, how do you do shifting if you've never learned how to finger first position on a violin? You know, uh, if I don't even know that there's a first and a third position, how am I going to understand what a shift is? Right. And so this process is very systematic and we feel, you know, we tweak it, but we feel it's very effective. Hmm. This is so powerful. Oh, and it's you. and I love that it starts with understanding what's happening in the body. And you talk about understanding the emotions. There's one thing that we discussed a lot this summer in the Music Mastery Experience, which is my group coaching program, yeah. that I actually had talked about in a blog, which is sometimes all you need to do is look at your case or the piano or, and you feel this sense of dread. Mm-hmm. Yes. And understanding that that feeling is coming from years of experience facing feelings of inadequacy in the practice room, feeling, um, you know, walking away from a practice session, feeling like you didn't accomplish your goals, getting yelled at in a lesson. You're standing in front of your case and your brain is bypassing all of these experiences, but they're all encompassed in this feeling of dread where you don't even want to open the case to practice. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and, 
And to add to that, and as I'm sure you've discovered students, sometimes they're not aware mm -hmm. that these things are already influencing the very next step they take. It's like we have all these, I wouldn't say unconscious because they can be made conscious. I mean, as part of what mindfulness is, is bringing in many ways, unconscious mental and physical and emotional habits and relationships to, to, to bear, you know, that we, we see them, we bring them to light. And then we say, okay, now that I know this, I know that I'm triggered in this way and that my body feels this way. And then I do all that. Can I let go of that and create a new set of intentions and narratives that are going to be more helpful, more kind, more compassionate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in my music making or in my life, really. I, mean, I think well, yeah, I'll say that it's very hard, you know, uh, <laughs> it's hard to just be mindful in one area of your life and, 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 and keep it compartmentalized. I feel like sometimes like if we don't address these things in our lives to some degree, they're going to bleed into our practice and in our practice out into our lives. I mean, you can to some degree, keep these things separate, but that's why I like thinking of it as a sort of all encompassing thing. Uh, but you're, you're 100% right. How do I, you know, one of the things that I train students to do is, um, imagine yourself going into a situation that makes you tense or angry. Okay. Use that. Okay. Def tell me exactly what you see. Tell me exactly where that shows up in your body. Mm. Tell me exactly what that feels like. Now look at that feeling. So, oh, I'm, you're feeling anger. When you think about your case, you're feeling anger right here in your jaw. You're feeling tension in your jaw. Touch your jaw. What does that feel like? Is it, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it okay? Now tell me the thoughts that are coming up as you touch your jaw. You see how all those things arise at the same time. And now imagine trying to do the next thing that you're going to do already colored by all of this stuff without you being aware of it, right? So our, our moments of mind bleed into each other. Our experiences bleed into each other. It isn't some by thing where, oh, God, now I'm going to practice. And what I, I'm leaving everything behind. No, you've, you're bringing your outside life and your experiences and, and, your, and your set habits into that room. So the quicker you become aware of that, the, the, the easier it's going to be for you to start realizing how this how this changes what you do and letting go and creating new things mm. which is the last step so you yes and, and and again this is something that you cannot get from somebody telling you okay let me teach you this breath awareness practice <laughs> it, it, it's it's more complicated and and it requires a lot of trial and error and a lot of understanding and each student is different and it's going to have different levels of understanding and being able to process this stuff and so you know that's one of the reasons i decided a few years ago to start the institute because I felt people, I have people who attend the Institute and do the teacher training. And by the way, for those that don't know, the Institute does teacher training. People do a one year, um, uh, you know, uh, training uh, with practicum and readings and, and group meetings and they apply it. And, you know, why does that matter? Well, because I think you get people who are really good, who understand kind of what's going on, but don't have a way of organizing it in a meaningful way or or maybe they have a great idea about something but they're not quite sure if that if it makes sense based on the science or the experience or some people we all get who are like i taught this thing and it seems to make sense but it doesn't work for everybody and i'm afraid of it and and so you go through a year of training to understand all these things and to practice them the same way you would anything else so that when you go back and teach them you're very well informed about all the different things that affect mindfulness. It sounds like you're doing some of that in your training in, in how you work with students. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that you're combining your experiences with what you've learned uh, and and you're understanding that it takes time to take people through these processes. So absolutely. And I absolutely want to hear about the institute later. But what oh, you sure, just yeah. said <laughs> reminded me so much of another thing I wanted to ask you about, which is you kind of gave us a recipe to deal with this, but I'd love to hear your perspective on uh, a recurring topic among my some students and coaching clients, which is how to deal and hopefully recover from performance-related trauma. Some people oh, have yeah. had some scary experiences in performance and um, or, you know, have had some maybe negative feedback from teachers or mentors or peers. And some of them have, you know, had some scary um, Yeah. And some yes. of them have developed debilitating stage fright as a result. Like, how can someone deal with this and things that they can do? Yeah, I, I don't think people like my answer when I tell them this, but I'm going to give them the answers. I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested in truth. First of all, this is part of the problem with, with the, I did a workshop, one weekend workshop of mindfulness, and now I understand it. Mm -hmm. Is that we, first of all, we have to, we have to be, be very clear 
musicians who do this kind of work to not believe we're therapists. We are right. not therapists. Uh, we are not psychologists. We we do not have specialized training in those areas. And so the very first thing I think is to teach people who teach this at whatever level of intervention to realize what their limitations are and to realize that trauma at some level, when it's real for somebody and it's physical and it's debilitating is not your thing to work on. It, what you do at that moment, you say, look, this is, this is significant. You need, I would recommend talking to a mental health professional or because you have everything from physical abuse to mental abuse to, you know, all sorts of things to just borderline sort of like, yeah, people were really bad to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And we all, so it's on a continuum, right? Trauma is usually something uh, debilitating, which a lot of times we have absolutely no conscious control over, right? We, we, or even sometimes we're not even aware of it. Okay. So first of all, is knowing what our limits are and knowing, knowing that, that we have to be trained to see when the trauma is something that we should not be working with, right? Okay, so how do you get there? Well, first of all, I think when we're working with students with mindfulness, um, uh, the very first thing we say is, if at any point you're uncomfortable with what I'm doing or with this process, please let me know and let's stop. Let's stop. Don't go further on anything because actually mindfulness can trigger trauma for some people. Yes. Uh, it, especially when, when you do body scans, for example, a person who's gone through physical, some kind of physical abuse or has had something happen in their bodies, a body scan is going to send them off the deep end because now you're hyper aware of something that you've been managing a different way. And if you don't have training in how to work with that, you're going to end up in a situation that can be very dangerous for that person. So it's the Hippocratic Oath of Mindfulness where I tell people, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm a practitioner, I'm not a therapist. Um, so we have to be clear right away that when we're teaching these things, I, I believe people should be able to opt out at any moment, the minute they feel uncomfortable, and that we start interventions very lightly, very easy. You know, a simple breath and we say, hey, if you're uncomfortable doing this, don't worry, just go ahead and stop, do something else, right? I'll take you as far as you'll let me help uh, take you uh, based upon what I know. Okay, number one. So that's one. Two, when the trauma occurs, I think we have to build rapport with our students so that they know that person's got your best interests at heart and is going to recommend action that is going to be helpful to them that maybe they're not qualified to do. Right. So, so, you know, if I, if a student has something trigger us, are you feeling uncomfortable in that part of your body? Okay. If you can't go any further, you feel something's going to be triggered. Let's just stop. Let's just stop. Um, you might need to talk to a therapist about that. If you want to talk to me about it um, and it's something you're comfortable that you feel is outside, you know, then I'm happy to hear you. Uh, you know, and, and be there, be a, be a, uh, uh, give them teacher presence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, be, be compassionate, uh, give them a positive regard, right? So, so a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people push or like, why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they interested? It's because it really shouldn't be pushed, right? Right. Okay. So let's just talk now. So, so let's just say that right away. We should be able to do that. We have to understand there are people that are neuro, neurocognitively diverse in the world. So some people can't do or hold, do some of the things we're asking them to do. So we have to find modifications. Uh, you know, a student might not be able to notice their breath, but, but they might be able to notice, uh, you know, uh, a sound or maybe able to touch something that's very physical as a sort of object. Right. So knowing that there are different anchors helps to sort of make it more neurodivergent. Right. Uh, allowing people to process their experiences the way they're processing without us getting in the way and say, oh, you should be experiencing this, which is actually antithetical to mindfulness. It's kind of weird. Right. right. But some people do that. No, you, you're, if you do this enough, your stress will go away. Okay. So, so then finally, I think for trauma, what we, you know, where is this mostly going to happen? Well, you can think of it as basically two major, uh, sort of three major places, I think in music. One is physical trauma, something that happened in your body that you're holding. And, you know, if, if it's not terrible, if it's something you can work through, you can work through students or a body scan and say, okay, what are you aware of how your feelings coming up, you know, to, to a certain degree and you're okay. But then is it really trauma? right? Then is it just discomfort, right? Um, you know, sort of psychological uh, narrative, sort of self-talk, right? And and how that goes on. And then the third one, I think, is relational. So triggered by specific types of relations. But and these are, there's many types, right? Uh, but, but I feel like people who work in this field and who do this should get some training. We need to, just like a teacher has to be, you know, trained to understand when their students are in distress and they recommend you know, uh, to go to a professional, I think that's part of what we need to do. And that does not exist right now um, uh, for a lot of mindfulness, a sort of ad hoc mindfulness teaching is that we don't have a, a really clear certification process that works for everyone. I don't think there has to be one. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the one way to do mindfulness. I'm not one of those people. Um, I'm not a, you know, my way or the highway guru, but I do feel like it is our responsibility to understand that mindfulness can cause trauma or exacerbate trauma and that we need to be aware of who to send people to when trauma is exacerbated beyond the point that we can work with them. How do you know that? You have to get training. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have to be trained. You have to understand how that works. So we're doing a little bit of that um, in, in the Institute. We're trying to get people in. I have a, a therapist that uh, is a good friend of mine who, do, who works with specific, she's a trauma therapist who I will have come in and talk to the students about noticing signs of trauma, knowing, knowing how to transition students from that. Uh, I also uh, have a, a teacher who has, uh, who works with neurodivergent students, students with uh, uh, who are on the autism spectrum or, uh, or who have other ways of processing where, how do I work with that particular kid? You know, how do I do that or that student? So we need to keep learning. That's a long answer to say, we better be careful, right? <laughs> we don't want to make, we, 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 you know, I really get scared that some people get a little bit of information mm -hmm. and then they're like, Oh, I totally know how to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to cure your problems with your parents because they're seeping into your music. Better be careful. Uh, cause we're, you know, we're not exactly trained that way. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I don't, that's <laughs> sort of my thoughts on it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, 100%. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of being able to identify these signs and there's just no easy answer in terms of, you know, how do you recover from performance trauma? How do you get ready to step on stage again and get that beyond other than granting yourself a lot of grace, yeah, experimenting with what works for you. And one thing I like to say too is building a list of little wins of creating experiences where you can perform in a safe environment. So you build up your confidence little by little. Yeah. And, and it just takes a lot of insightfulness. Hopefully that's a term in English. Yeah, well, yeah. And you, you, you know, I always tell people, anyone with a doctorate can make up a term. So, <laughs> that's so you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're right. And that's where we can help, you know, pointing, you know, when, when I hear you speak about these things, what I think of is being a good, a be, part of being a good teacher, a good coach is having, being, understanding, have enough rapport with the person that you're working with that you can help take them where they want to go and maybe even push them a little bit more, but not push them beyond the point that you can help them. A good coach is no when they, when they're no longer, you know, <laughs> this is beyond me. Right. But yeah. at the same time, they can serve as, as, um, as, as, a, as somebody who's supportive and who can point out good things. Here. Part of the mindfulness thing is to point out, to be able to focus your attention on victories Right. Uh, we have an exercise with my students where I'll say, OK, so this terrible thing happened to you. I had a, a particular student who who is vi who is a perfectionist and they had a really bad experience in a competition. And, you know, they really beat themselves up. So we, we you know, years of rapport with the student, with this client. And I sat down and said, OK, let's talk about this. Well, that's so, you know, that there are various ways of looking at experience. Can we take I want you to step outside of that experience and tell me what are some things you learned about that and some positive things about the thing that you're calling a failure, which it could be a failure in some way. In some universe, it's a failure. But in another universe, it's actually a positive thing that you're learning from is going to make you stronger. How could we frame that and, and look, be able to see that every single situation has a variety of interpretations mm -hmm. and that our job is to understand that um that to some degree we have some agency about which interpretation we want to use to right so um, maybe uh, you know if if the point is to be a masterful musician and never has any problems and has no performance anxiety you can try that narrative and you can embody it but it's going to hurt you long term because that's not possible but maybe i per performed for the first time this is the first time my leg didn't shake that's a victory how can you see that both of those things are can be negative and positive and that you can, that you don't have to stick to either one that there's a vast array of interpretations of something that your mind can give to something that are true, but some are going to be more helpful for you. And some are going to be interpretations that help you be kinder to yourself and others. Mm -hmm. Right. And so your values are really involved, but that takes time. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do to train people to do that. Mm. Frank, I love this window into your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and before I take you through the round of rapid fire questions, which I joke sure. is never very rapid. Um, I, I just want to ask you, is, is there anything I didn't ask that you, you really feel like you'd like to uh, give to the listeners? Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I, I think the bottom line here, I think 
that w- when we want to boil down mindfulness, to, why is mindfulness useful? Mindfulness gives you choices, mm. right? Mindfulness gives you choices. I, I want, we grow up our entire lives being told you're this, you're that. We internalize so many narratives about the world and who we are, and who we should be and what are our, our pro- and you know, some of this we can't help. It's just part of life, right? But, but I want to know that where I do have a choice in choosing the way that I, I um, uh, respond to my life and my reality, if I do have a choice, I want to know where I have those choices. And, and I think that the, the path of mindfulness is to constantly be, not, I would use the word vigilant because I think that's too much of a word, but let's just say some level of vigilance about, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that just a set of mental habits that I have that I apply to this situation without thinking about it? Or is there a better set of habits mm. that I can develop that are going to make me, first of all, for me, most importantly, a kinder person. Um, if, it, if it, you know, in music, I, I think you we need that. We need people to be kinder to themselves, to others, more cooperative, which I think leads to creativity, which I think, so, so I, what I tell people is, do you want to know what's driving your life? You know, do you want to hold a mirror and do you want to start taking some, small actions to start affecting that so that you're not a victim of everything that happens to you and that you feel like you have no agency or resilience to work with it does not ignore the fact that people are terrible, that situations can be bad, that there's everything from, uh, you know, systemic racism to sexism to, I mean, does not deny any of that, but knowing that now, how do, what, what do I want to do for my next step? What's the next thing I want to do um, without without negating that those things happen, right? Where do I have some agency and some choice? And I think that's very empowering from to, to, to people who have never been told that they have some choice over how they respond to things. Mm. So that's what I want to tell people about mindfulness as a musician or anything else. You know, you, you owe it to yourself to give to, to know that you have more resources inside of you than you probably think or have been told uh, that you have. Mm. It's incredibly powerful. Thank you for this. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> so how about a round of rapid fire questions? Sure, of course. What skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? Yeah, I think um, uh, mental uh, and, and emotional skills. Um, so So spending time working on things like mindfulness or an other contemplative practices, um, skills, you know, all the skills that help us be more creative and open and aware and resilient. So you can do that a lot of different mindfulness is one way of doing that. Right. But I think, you know, the path of musicians is no longer what it was before. Right. It, it, you can't say I'm going to go to school and be the, 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 the concert master of the C- CSO. Well, good luck. That person has to retire. Uh, you have, you know, you hope there isn't a pandemic where mm-hmm. everybody's unemployed for, you know, that's not the wisest way to go into the field. So one thing to to, to just use, take classes that help you think about who you are, what your, what, what life, what meat, what gives your life meaning um, and how many different ways can you use music to, to have a meaningful life that, that is not going to tie you to one way of being. And so, you know, um, uh, psychology classes, psychological skills, resilience skills, uh, you know, nutrition classes, learning how to keep your body healthy, right? All of that might not be directly related to music, but it certainly informs um, the kind of life you're going to have as a musician. So that's what I would say about that. Mm-hmm. If you could recommend that musicians have one tool in the practice room, which one would it be? <laughs> Imagination and goal setting. It's two. I realize oh. it. Uh, you know, you you have to imagine, even if it's not going to work out the way you want it to. You have to have some template for what you for the kind of person you want to be and the kind of musician you want to be. Because then I think you go towards situations in your life that are going to, uh, uh, you know, um, help you meet those goals. If I just sit in a room and, and do exactly what people tell me to do, that may be a fine to some degree, but. If that's if eventually doesn't line up with who I am or what I'm trying to do, then then I'm not going to stay motivated. So I think it it helps to take time everyone and just imagine what do you want your life to be like. And when you walk into the practice room, stop and say, I'm going to spend 30 minutes of my life here now or an hour or whatever 
is what I'm doing here supporting the vision of the life that I want to have as a musician, as a student, as a teacher, right? And if and and but that changes, it changes as your life changes, as other things happen. But to not connect with that, I think makes us sort of like a victim of you know circumstance. Everything is just happening and I have no control over it, and I don't even know why it's happening. I think in a way it whether I always tell people whether there's meaning in the world or not, whatever your religious or philosophical views are fine whether it exists out there inherently or not human beings need meaning to exist they need to create meaning and so you either you can say well i don't know if the world has meaning or not but i have to find meaning because i'm we're wired this way and music is one of the ways that we find meaning so spending time in your imagination and goal setting i think is a part of how you deal with that aspect of of being a, a human and a teacher and a musician mm. do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to the listeners so I love this book. I, I did. I met a guy named Richard Wolf um, a couple of years ago. I went to University of South, uh, uh, Southern California. He wrote a book called In Tune, Music as the Bridge to Mindfulness. Mm. And uh, Richard is interesting. He's a producer. He's worked with a lot of like big uh, hip hop stars and he's a meditator. But what I love about Richard, what's unique about Richard is that Richard was a bad meditator. <laughs> or he says, I was, a, I was bad at meditation. So what I needed to do is find how music was meditation for me. Wow. And so he reverses it. He, you know, I start from when we give our talks, I start from all these processes and then apply them to music. And he starts from music and goes backwards to the processes. And it's such a good book. It's so clear. And it, and it's really, um, refreshing and empowering. And he's a great guy. He's hilarious. Uh, he, he teaches out at, you know, at the Thornton school. Um, I, I, it's one of my favorite books on, on mindfulness and music. I think that has come out in the last few years. Um, so, so I would highly recommend buying his book and I get no endorsements or anything like that from <laughs> it. I just, I just really like him and I like his approach to it. That sounds amazing. That sounds like the book I'll be buying for all my students and clients as a Hey. Christmas present. <laughs> it's a great book. I, I, uh, it's, it's on my list, um, in my, in my class, um, you know, as highly recommended reading. Mm, thank you for this recommendation. Sure. What is the, well, maybe not best advice, but one advice that was given to you that you would like to pass on to the listeners? Yeah, I actually spoke to somebody yesterday who reminded me of this advice. It's interesting. I had, I had an, I had a teacher, at, at, um, who I'm going to paraphrase paraphrase what he told me. So I'm a really hard time at school. And he said, you know, you don't have to accept other people's visions of what, of who you are and what your life should be. You don't have to accept that, right? What the world, you, you can choose a narrative. You can choose a way of looking at the world that is going to uplift you and that is going to give your life meaning and trajectory. And, and, and part of this career in this life is to just decide you're going to choose the vast portion of that, the, you know, what, who you are and what you're going to do, no matter who you are. That was the, you know, the single best piece of advice uh, I ever had because it reframed everything. Uh, and this incredible teacher, uh, actually I'll, I'll name him. His name is, uh, is Tom Riccobono. He teaches at Interlochen uh, uh, in the yearly year long program. He's a graduate student. I was really having a, I'm so, I'm all over the place. I was having such a hard time staying like focused. Mm. Uh, and it was not, I didn't know how to practice. I didn't have lessons as a kid, you know, really, I was just kind of a, a good musician that didn't have a lot of training and I just wasn't getting doing well in music school, as you can imagine, you know, people who had already learned that culture and he just sat me down and says, what do you want to do? And he goes, okay, let go of any ideas that you can't do that. And, and, you know, maybe you don't accomplish that goal. Sure. Maybe I teach you all this stuff and you don't accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish, right. Or who you want to be but you're going to have a much higher chance <laughs> to do it if you believe that you can do it versus thinking you're never going to be able to do it. And I was like, gosh, thank you. You know, I, I had some ridiculous goal. By the way, I didn't accomplish the goal, the two goals that I set out. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't because my life is a lot better for it. But I remember I wanted to be a principal um, at that point, a principal trombonist of, of the New York Phil, you know, and he, and he was like, okay, well, what would you need to do in order to, to have a chance mm -hmm. to make that happen? And that was, I was 19 years old. He didn't say, well, that's impossible. And you should have a more realistic goal. He said, you know, whether you accomplish it or not here, here's how you might get there. Mm. I love that. I've re that's really, that really changed my life in a lot of ways. That's extremely beautiful and so liberating. And I can think of so many listeners that probably need to hear this right now. So thank you so much for giving it to us. Oh, you're welcome. It's pl my pleasure. <laughs> Finally, how about a quick actionable tip that listeners could implement today in their musical life? Yeah. 
yeah, the next time you go in a practice room, pause, just pause for one moment. Um, get in your body, notice your breath, pause and think, what do I want to do right now? What is it that I want to get out of this? And how are the things that are going in my happening, my mind, my emotions and, and, and everything else, how are they either supporting that or not? They're not supporting whatever you're going to do at that moment. Let it go and, and go for the things you want to do and take a moment to do that. Every time you step in a practice room, anytime you start a conversation with somebody, anytime you do anything at all, take pause more. We, we can get off the boat. You know, mm -hmm. it's like we're on, on a river, we're on the boat, the, the river is going to keep going. Uh, but, but you don't want to wake up all of a sudden and be on the boat in the river, not knowing where you're going. Mm -hmm. You can take the river to the shore, stop and look at where the, look at where the stream or the river is going. So, okay, I can get back on the boat now, but at least I know kind of where it's going. And so take that, make that a, a mental and, and, uh, I could even call it a spiritual practice, pausing to reconnect with, with who you are and what you want to be. I love that. <laughs> Frank, you mentioned the Mindfulness-Based Wellness and Pedagogy Institute. Please tell us yeah. a little bit more about that. Where can people sure. find more information and check it out, maybe sign up? Sure. Yeah. So we're in a little bit of a hiatus right now because of the pandemic. We're restructuring a little bit. So this year, we haven't done our usual teacher training, but we will be back hopefully either uh, spring or summer of this year with some retreats, uh, online retreats and other things. I would say go to www mb-wp.org www.mb-wp.org you can get a sense of what we've been doing um it's you know the website uh i'm not the best website manager and it's a small institute but we've trained a lot of teachers and they're doing a lot of really amazing things and um and i think if you're interested in learning more about the specific way that we uh do mindfulness at the institute which is just one way Uh, in teacher training, uh, starting a retreat, we have a great group of teachers and a nice institute, and uh, we're learning and growing. So come check it out, mm. and uh, you know, and it, oh, you can always send me an email. Uh, uh, the email contact information is on there, and uh, I can put you on an email list and let you know when our next event is. So, I feel like I never learned enough about this. So you might see my my face pop in. I would love it. <laughs> I, you know what? We get people. Uh, we just had a wonderful person go through our teacher training program. Who was a longtime meditator and mindfulness practitioner, uh, Laura Talbot Clark. She's a violin professor at Oklahoma State. She came in knowing a lot. Uh, she had already her own system, but going through a year of learning how to put it into words and practicing was so significant for her. So we welcome people with a lot of experience, people who have no idea what's going on <laughs> and are just curious. And, and we build a really nice community. So we'd love to see you there. We'd love for you to come out and spend some time with us. So Sounds amazing. Frank, Great. you shared such important information, so much wisdom with us today. You know, I'd say life-changing information. And I cannot thank you enough for accepting to chat with me. Oh, thank you, Renee. It was my pleasure. I, I, I really enjoyed talking about these things. And I hope, I hope some of what I said today is uh, useful uh, for people. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this and having this show. I, I, I looked through the podcast. I was like, ooh, that's, that's a lot of really cool people that I admire. I'm going to go, go click on this. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Frank Diaz. If you're guessing that I loved it, you would be right. Frank is speaking my language, and I think you can see from what he said why mindfulness is at the core of the deep practice model in everything mind over finger. Because it's not about constantly seeking more knowledge, watching one more tutorial about vibrato, uh, getting the latest practice tip from an Instagram personality. Those are great, sure. But progress on your instrument and growing as an artist is about the ability to be in your experience, to be able to hear yourself objectively, to assess your playing objectively. It's about being able to understand the physical sensations you're experiencing while you're playing and nurturing the ability to analyze problems and come up with solutions. That's how you can improve your technique and your expressivity through awareness in combination with the information you already have and continue to gather. 
And even more than that, it's how you are as a person, how you show up for yourself in everyday life, how you're able to control your thoughts and guide yourself through the process with objectivity, self-compassion, and a positive attitude. Because yes, the information can come from the outside, but your results will always, always come from the inside. So if you relate to this conversation, let Frank and I know by getting in touch with us and let's keep this conversation going. I'm Mind Over Finger on both Instagram and Facebook and Frank is on Twitter at Music Zen Dude. As always, I'll have all the information related to this episode in the show notes, and you can find them via your podcast app or by visiting mindoverfinger.com. And if what we talked about today resonates with you, I hope you'll join me this summer for the Music Mastery Experience. It's my life-changing, highly personalized group coaching program where I take you through a massive transformation in your music making. We're going to cover all of those beautiful things we talked about today, and I'll give you all the tools to bring more mindfulness, presence, intentionality, and efficiency in your practice so you can start to experience the results you want in performance and in your musical life. Ingel, a previous participant, said this about the Music Master experience. Renee has brought incredible value to my life as a musician. With her sincerity, she creates a safe space to grow. The support, knowledge, and guidance she provides has deeply transformed my practice and my confidence as a violinist. Definitely the best investment of 2020. And it's not too early to save your spot. And if you sign up now, you get access to some pretty cool bonuses. So go to mindoverfinger.com slash amami and let's talk. And one more thing before I sign off. This February in the tribe, we're talking about performance-related trauma, how it happens, how it affects us, and strategies to overcome it. So if this is a topic that occupies some space in your head and your heart, join the conversation at facebook.com slash groups slash Mind Over Finger Tribe. That's it for today. Again, thank you. And à bientôt.